our guest, David K. Johnson, was an obvious choice to speak to us, since at one time or another, almost every board member suggested getting him here. <laughs> and now the timing is quite right. David has a new book out about our favorite subject, and it's called, It's Even Worse Than You Think, <laughs> What the Trump Administration is Doing to America. And remember, the last I heard, David is a registered Republican. Also, <laughs> for, for, forgive me, David. <laughs> also, while my accountant is still scratching ahead over the new tax law, David might or might not tell us about it. After all, he won a 2001 Pulitzer for beat reporting with, as the Pulitzer Committee wrote, his penetrating and enterprising reporting that exposed loopholes and inequities in the U.S. tax code, which was instrumental in bringing about reforms. David's book will be on sale and saved, signed by David right after he speaks. It will be $16, retail price is $28. Also, I understand that we have another 2001 Pulitzer winner here, Susan DeShilo, who won for 9-11. I think she's sitting... There's a lot more that I can say about our guest speaker, David K. Johnson, who has the world's largest file on Donald Trump. Larger than the FBI's, the CIA's, the New York State Attorney General's, the KGB's, and, and Stormy Daniels. <laughs> but I'm going to let David do the talking, and when he's finished and the Q&A comes up, please be sure to ask David about his DC report. David. Thank you. Well, how nice to be here today with all of you. And all I can tell you is that you really should come back for Andy Borowitz because he's funny and as my daughter, the uh, comedy writer says, Dad, you're not funny. <laughs> so, the reason that Simon & Schuster titled this book, it's not my title, it's theirs, it's even worse than you think, is that during the campaign there was a, can you hear me everywhere by the way? Yes. Okay, during the campaign there was a complete breakdown of the coverage of Donald Trump. We didn't scrub him. God, an audience where I don't have to explain a scrub. And the reason I believe is that his antics were so fascinating Donald is like a crash on the other side of the highway where we all slow down, every one of us, we all slow down to rubberneck, only he's got dancing girls and a marching band and fireworks. And it was like, wow. And nobody went and asked the basics. Between the day of Donald's announcement when I was alone in saying he might get it, not likely, but he might, you cannot exclude this possibility until election day. The New York Times, ran exactly four pieces that had the word Trump and Mafia, and they were all passing mention. Not a word about the major international cocaine trafficker he was involved with up to his eyeballs, and did things that only make sense if they were in business together, traffic in, co in cocaine and marijuana. Not one word about a number of other shady deals that Donald has done, and the, many of the others done in a way by every news organization that touched them of sort of, well, this is kind of unusual, but you know, it's not clear what went on here. And interestingly, I had 12 foreign television news crews come to my house in Rochester, New York to film me, depending on the weather, either in my garden or in my living room. ABC, NBC, CBS, never even a phone call, PBS, edited out every reference when I spoke to them about Donald and criminal activity. People did not know when they voted who they were voting for. Now, once Trump took office, I gotta say, I think the coverage in the White House has been fantastic. The palace intrigues, the craziness. Um, I was asking Clyde Haberman, you know, how did his daughter Maggie get under Donald's skin? Because she clearly is, and he's talking to her and not thinking when he's talking to her. What a fantastic job journalists have been doing. The problem is we're not covering our government. And notice that I call it our government. 
the nonprofit news service that some friends and I created. No ads, we depend entirely on donors. I put money into it, I don't get paid anything. DC Report, singular, dcreport.org. We always talk about our government and our constitution because we own it and we ought to act like owners. And when you don't act like owners, when you put it out to other people to do the job of democracy, what you get is Donald Trump. Well, when you look into our government, which generally is not being covered, there is no mainstream reporter assigned to cover the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, one of the most powerful and important agencies of the federal government, even though it only employs about 1,500 people. Every month when you write a check to Con Ed, when you write a check for natural gas, or for water if you don't live in the city of New York, FERC is affecting what you're spending money on. And yet nobody covers it. Housing and urban development, tens of billions of dollars, no reporter. The sales department of the US government, its revenue department, the IRS, there is no dedicated mainstream reporter over there covering it. And so what's going on in our government that we have pulled out from interviewing people who are there, from uh, going through the federal register, the official government book of what the government's doing and elsewhere, is what went into it's even worse than you think. And no matter how assiduously you have followed the news, you don't know what's happening if you don't know what's happening to our government. And let me give you a couple of examples, killer examples. Raise your hand. How many of you have heard of the RCEP? One of the most important economic issues in the entire world, and it's uncovered in American news. I was a prominent critic of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the proposed Transatlantic Partnership. In fact, the editor who edited some of my columns is in this room. And uh, it was because that, those deals, particularly the TPP, gave too much power to monopolists and reduced human rights. They're fixable problems. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is 13 Pacific Rim countries led by us, was designed in part to contain China. Donald Trump comes into office, he kills the TPP. It creates a vacuum. The RCEP then emerges. It is China's competing plan, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Probably a few people in this room old enough to remember the Japanese co-prosperity plan before World War II, or at least learned about it when they were young. Well, that's 15 Pacific Rim countries, not us, plus India. And in the fall, I traveled all over the world. I did 51,000 air miles over two months going around the world talking. And when I was in Australia, the thing I was struck by was, this is the most loyal ally America has. Absolute lapdogs to us. Vietnam, anywhere else, whatever we do, Australia's like, yes, sir, absolutely. Uncle Sam, what do you need? Everybody I talked to, government officials, national journalists, uh, academic leaders at the University of Sydney and from a couple of other schools, prominent business people, the chambermaid for my hotel, all said the same thing. We have to begin pivoting away from Washington and toward Beijing because Trump's not doing anything and we want to have a prosperous future. And to quote Donald Trump, we have no choice. How is this not front page news in the United States? How is this not on the evening news? in the United States. I'll give you another killer example, one that may literally kill you. Remember these horrendous accidents we've had with trains and uh, where the conductor of the train or the driver of a truck or a bus has sleep apnea and suddenly falls asleep for a second and there's a crash and people die? I have sleep apnea. It's an entirely treatable affiliation, affliction. The Obama administration said, well, we test airline pilots because we don't want them suddenly falling asleep when they're taking off or landing or moving the flaps. So let's test bus drivers, train conductors, and truck drivers. Trump came in and immediately killed this. People are literally going to die because of this. Now, there was one problem with the Obama administration rules, which is if you're not already working for a trucking company or you're an independent operator and don't have health insurance, it was going to cost you a lot of money. But that's a simple function of 
employers have to pay for the testing. Or the government will pick up the bill for the testing as a matter of public safety. But they've killed that rule. At the education department, Betsy DeVos, absolutely the most qualified education secretary in the history of America, <laughs> someone deeply versed in theory of education, has taken the side of the bankers against the brains. What's the most valuable asset we have in America? It's young minds that need to be developed and given rigor. That's what creates wealth, is up here. That's what creates social stability. But Betsy DeVos brings in to deal with the student loan crisis the people who created it. This is not bringing in the, the fox to guard the hen house because she told them to make changes. This is hiring the fox to redesign the hen house to make sure the foxes dine well. <laughs> now, in the book, I talk about what I call political termites. The Trump administration has loosed people you have never heard of. People whose names, in some cases, are only very technically in the public record, and put them into the government in all sorts of positions. And this isn't Donald. Donald is a lazy guy. I've known him for 30 years. During the campaign, you know, he would go, Hillary's really lazy. You notice she was out there every day, dawn to dusk, until she literally collapsed one day getting into a vehicle. What you didn't read was, Donald Trump disappeared from the campaign trail for five days. He was at Trump Tower. Didn't see any stories saying, where's Donald Trump? Donald Trump says she's lazy. Why are there no news stories saying, well, where is he? She's out on the campaign trail. And they didn't appear. Nobody reported that. Partly because Hillary Clinton didn't say that. It's one of the flaws in, in journalism. Well, these political termites come from the industries that are supposed to be regulated by the various federal agencies. Why do we have regulations? A lot of people think this is a newfangled idea. It, you, you can read in the National Review and places like it about how this is a modern idea, regulation. You know, for nine years I taught in the, I'm not a lawyer, but I taught in the law school and the graduate business school at Syracuse, the regulatory law of the ancient world. Hammurabi's Code, the Old Testament, Egyptian law, Greek law, Indian, East Indian law, Chinese law, ancient Roman law. Everything is regulated. Baseball. I love baseball, but you know what? It's trivia at the end of the day. It doesn't matter. Baseball regulates how many stitches are on the ball, the color of the yarn, the color of the hide, the weight of the ball. Universities now regulate dating. I always bring up my students. This university regulates dating. How do they do it? And I get these. Until suddenly, finally, it's always a female student says, oh, you mean sexual harassment. And I go, that's right. When is it dating and when does it become sexual harassment? We regulate this. And then we have a discussion about, you know, when do you, what, what crosses the line? And there is no bright line. It's a, as the lawyers like to say, facts and circumstances test. This administration announced openly to everybody that it was their intent to destroy our government. Steve Bannon was clear as a bell. I am a Leninist. What is a Leninist? My goodness, this is a room of people I don't have to explain that to. Thank goodness. Trust me, when I go and speak in places like Michigan, I got to explain what a Leninist is. We are going to, he said, deconstruct the existing order. You know, highfalutin talk for, we're going to destroy the ability of the U.S. government to protect you, to protect your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, to make sure that when you open a can of tuna, you don't worry you're going to get sick and die. We're going to destroy all of that. And at agency after agency that I go through in the book, they have been doing exactly that. They've compromised records in some agencies, which means that they cannot use those records in criminal proceedings, which are rare, but they're also subject to attack in civil proceedings. The Labor Department has for years put up every single worker death on the internet. About 4,800 Americans a year are killed on the job. 
the Trump administration, I mean, the Obama administration began putting up press releases to shame those companies where deaths weren't the result of the sort of inevitable accident you couldn't see, but the result of bad practices. Because the fines for killing a worker are bupkis. Well, we wrote about it at DC Report, and then they start putting it back up. I can't prove one caused the other. I can only tell you the order of what should happen. And then they stopped again. And then last August, they stopped posting the names of workers killed on the job. So if you go to the Labor Department today and say, listen, we'd like statistical information. In the year 2017, how many American workers died? How many were electrocuted? How many were crushed? How many died from a fall? You know what they'll tell you? You can't have that information. Who benefits from that? The worst employers. This administration is creating a cacistocracy. That is a government of the most corrupt, the most venal, the most incompetent, a government of the worst. Now that's a relatively modern word. It's only been in use for about 300 years. But it comes from the ancient Greek. And I love the, the way it just has this wonderful feel. It's a cacistocracy. That's what we're getting. Now, millions of Americans think that Donald Trump is a demigod. Not a demagogue, a demigod. They believe he is their savior. They believe he's the only person who's looking out for them. What I show in the book is that the minute Donald Trump finished speaking about the forgotten man, he forgot about him and he has turned on him. Everything from saying we want the checks that go to disabled veterans to be reduced by rounding down. It's not a lot of money. You know, the most you can lose is 99 cents every month. But the symbolism of this rounding down. Disabled veterans. My dad was a 100% disabled veteran of World War II, so I went to college on the GI Bill, even though I never served. And... What do they propose to do with disabled veterans? Well, for many of them, the first Trump budget said, when you reach retirement age, we're going to cut your income from $35,000 a year to 13. Just remember that the next time you see a video where Donald Trump goes, I love the veterans. Nobody loves the veterans like Donald Trump. You know, we all love our veterans, don't we? I love our veterans. No, you don't. No, you don't. Now, that will never become law. Congress will not allow that, but that's not the point. The point is that's what they want to do. This is a party of backing up Trump now that says we want to have individual freedom and individual choice, except if you're poor when it comes to eating, in which case we're going to send you a box and tell you what you're going to eat. This is a party that says you have to go through extensive checking to see if you're allowed to vote, but if you want to buy a weapon of mass murder, just walk down and buy one. I mean, look what's happened in Florida yesterday, where they turned down in Tallahassee in the House of Representatives a proposal that would have just led to debate on should we allow these weapons of mass killing, which have no place in the world except on a battlefield or possibly in some cases with the police. They're not useful for hunting. They're not good for target practice. And by the way, I say this as somebody who has owned many guns, who's been shot, luckily with a rubber, with a plastic bullet, and who took the LAPD's combat training course with no notice and scored a 98.9, killed both bad guys with three bullets. Maximum score, he can get 100. We need to recognize in this country that we have made a terrible mistake. Now, one of the things that's happening in our country, though, is that Trump fatigue is setting in. I encounter people, I've been traveling all over the country now since January 16th, I'm going to go to Europe in April, I've got a heavy schedule of talks and I'm trying to book as many more as I can just as I did with the making of Donald Trump. And again and again and again when I speak to audiences I have people who say, well, I was trying to get my, my grown son or my husband or my uh, next door neighbor to come and they just said, I don't want to hear any more about Trump. I just don't want to hear any more. And they're turned off. And what's even more alarming is a fair number of these people say that the people that they tried to get to come say they're not even going to vote in the next election. At the end of the day, all that matters is voting. 
This country was created on an idea that if we ennobled the human spirit and set it free, we could see what human beings are capable of accomplishing. It was founded by people who were just like us. There were menches and there were bastards. There were drunks and there were ascetics. But they were all reasonably well educated and most of them, especially those involved in framing our constitution, had studied their classical period history. Adams and Madison wrote that what they thought would be the greatest danger to the future of America, and they both, by the way, wrote about the period after, interestingly, 1930, because they did some math on yeoman farmers, that what would destroy this country would be extreme inequality. They wrote about what I have condensed down to a business aristocracy. And they warned that in the future, if many, many people were pure wage earners, if they did not own any property, they did not own the land to farm or the tools for their trade, but instead worked for someone else and had no property, that they would have no understanding of property, and they would be deceived by this business aristocracy into voting for policies that were inimical to their interests and actually benefited the business arist aristocrats, which it seems to me is a reasonable description of what's gone on in this country in recent years. Now, <clears throat> We need to appreciate that the people who voted for Donald Trump have real grievances, and we as a country have to address them, or that, not Donald Trump, will be the end of our country. Donald Trump ran for office on the David K. Johnston economic platform. I wrote a trilogy of best-selling books when I was still at the New York Times, well, two of them while I was there, uh, perfectly Legal about taxes, Free Lunch about hidden subsidies, and the fine print about competition. If you know that Walmart builds its stores often with your tax dollars, that General Electric has built whole factories with uh, uh, your tax dollars, it's probably because of my work. If you know that multinational corporations literally turn a profit off the corporate income tax, it's my work. We were the first to report at DC Report that this tax bill that all the major papers said, oh, Apple's gonna pay $38 billion in taxes. If the reporters had read the bill, they would have realized that Apple got an eight-year loan at zero interest for $38 billion, and it was gonna pay $3 billion this year, and they would pay 25% or $9.5 billion in the last year of the loan, 2025. Little bit different than Apple's gonna pay $38 billion in taxes. When my trilogy was done, I gave interviews in 2012 in which I said, the bottom 90% of Americans' incomes are lower today than they were in 1967, the year I finished high school. And the data that came out later substantiated that. People got 51 and a half weeks income for, every, for the 52 weeks in 1967, if you're in the bottom 90%. People at the 95th percentile level, their incomes hardly went up after all those years. People at the top, well, there are various ways to measure it, but one of the ways to measure it is what happened to the income of that bottom 90% in 2014 when they were ahead a little bit. And if we treated that as a shoebox where they would be ahead $5,500, and we put the shoebox here on the table on end, how did the top 400, to, oh, from 1961, I'm sorry, 1961, they were $5,500 ahead. What if, how did the top 400 tax returns do? People who turned in the 400 biggest tax returns. Well, they had more boxes with $5,500 each in them after taxes. They had enough boxes that they would go up through the ceiling. They go through the roof of this building. 28,600 feet into the air to one box. People in the bottom 90% are pissed and they should be. Their unions are gone, their pensions are gone, their stability is gone, and people in the bottom 50% literally live in a state of economic terror. I live in Rochester, New York, a city where Business Week did a cover story in 1967 about the richest city in America. Xerox 914 machine, Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, Gannett Newspapers, a whole bunch of other companies. Today, statistically, 
Every sixth person you meet in the city of Rochester lives at less than half the poverty level. We have families in Rochester with four people who live on less than $1,000 a month. We have hundreds and hundreds of homeless kids in Rochester, the richest city in America 50 years ago, who are homeless. They get by by couch surfing. When the weather's warm, they sleep under railroad bridges. And what is our policy? Donald Trump got us a tax bill. A tax bill that today's New York Times tells me many, many people think is good for them. And in the short run, it is. And I said so before it was passed. That in the short run, ordinary people would go, hey, I haven't had a raise in years. I suddenly got 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a week more in my paycheck. This is a big boon to me. But over 80% of the benefits go to the 1%. By the way, a little fact to tuck away about the 1%, because I'm in the 1%. The bottom half of the 1% are two income couples who work all year to make four hundred dollars to $600,000 a year. They're making a lot of money. I'm not feeling sorry for them, but they're not coupon clippers. They're highly paid workers. More than half the benefits go to people who make over $2 million a year. Now, the Republicans have made very clear, and Donald Trump is with them on this, that America has a very clear, obvious economic problem. And the Republicans have identified it very clearly. They're not going to use the words I use, but when I say them, I don't think anybody will dispute my interpretation of them. The reason we don't have enough jobs in America, the reason the infrastructure is falling apart, is the rich don't have nearly enough. And unless the rich have more, they won't invest and they won't create jobs. And so their plan to do that is you cut their taxes, you get rid of the regulations that cost money, like, you know, removing heavy metals from water before you flush it into the river where we get water to drink. And you tell them you got to put scrubbers on your smokestack so we don't breathe mercury and our children or grandchildren don't get cancer and asthma and, lung disease and heart disease. That'll up your profits if you don't have to clean up after yourself. And the way to finance this, well, you go after children, the disabled, the elderly, the sick, the poor people who can't fight back. And the Democrats? What are the Democrats for? I actually asked Nancy Pelosi that question in San Francisco, where I was born last year. Articulate to me what we're for. Well, we're for people. You know, excuse me, and, and this is the leader of the People's Party who wears $4,000 sheath dresses so she can show off the fact that she has a figure most 20-year-old women would die for and wears Christian Louboutin high heels with their red soles. This is the leader of the party of the people? I'm not anything against money at all. Zero. But good grief. Can we get somebody who, you know, is a little better connected? Uh, when we had this actual conversation, and I mentioned something about her clothing, she pointed out she was wearing dungarees and a blue chambray shirt. And I said, yes, that's true, Nancy, but they're tailored. <laughs> so. Um, I actually hope every one of you reads my book, not because of the money I'm going to make from it, that's how I make my living, but because if you don't read it, you're really not going to know what's going on, and because we need to get people to understand what is being done to our government, to our democracy, to our liberty, to our phys physical well-being, to our financial well-being. Now, if you want to live in a society where we're going to increase the upward redistribution of wealth and income through government policies, you should go vote for Donald Trump. You should go vote for everybody Paul Ryan backs up, everybody Mitch McConnell backs up. If you think we aren't having enough kids in high schools killed, you should go vote Republican. Max Boot, principled Republican, prominent thinker in Republican circles for years, said last week or two weeks ago on MSNBC, that every Republican should go vote out Republicans who are in office unless they've stood up to Trump. Every single one. This is a really bad time. This election coming up in November is the most important election in this country since the Civil War, and I'm including 1932 in this. We either are going to recognize we made a mistake and we're going to go through the awful process, and trust me, if Donald Trump is removed by impeachment or by being voted out either in a primary or general election, there will be blood. There will be trouble over this. There is no good ending to this story. And if he is not tried, 
convicted and sent to prison for his many crimes that I've described in my two books, he will, upon leaving office, spend the rest of his days traveling this country, fomenting violence, if not revolution. And if you doubt that, just remember that when he was trying to get people to vote for him, he would point to people and say, beat him up, I'll pay your legal bills. Imagine, without any constraints on him anymore, what Donald Trump would do. And I haven't even talked with you about Donald Trump's divided loyalties. How much the Kremlin is in his pockets. How much the Kremlin is in his pockets. Donald Trump is not a loyal American. And the American public is not ready to hear that because the news media have failed to properly educate people about what's going on. In fact, the function of public hearings like we had during Watergate is being fulfilled by Robert Mueller's court filings. But TV hearings, televised hearings every night would do a much better job. Um, I look forward to answering questions from you. And I'll just, two things. Please ask a question because we've got a very limited amount of time, number one. And secondly, number two, people are, somebody's almost, almost every time asks me, why do you hate Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't hate Donald Trump. I find Donald Trump endlessly fascinating. I thought he was fascinating when I met him in 1988. And I try to keep in mind what the famous homicide detective Jigsaw John said when he invited me to his, I think it was his 65th or 70th birthday party. He was still a homicide detective and I'm in a room with uh, more than a thousand drunk homicide detectives <laughs> and not feeling frankly especially comfortable. And he put his arm around me and in front of a bunch of these guys, told about how I had personally hunted down a murderer and gotten an innocent man freed from prison. And then he said, you know, David understands what we understand. I don't care who the killer is. All I care is that I get the killer. Donald Trump is the president. It's a mistake. If we don't fix it, we will suffer for it. Your children will suffer for it. Your grandchildren will suffer for it. Thank you. Knowing what we do now about <clears throat> the media coverage and the fact that his, that his base... I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. And the fact that his base is paying absolutely no attention to the, uh, right. the uh, popular media coverage. Do you think that if the media had done a better job, which okay. you said they didn't during the campaign, that it would have made a difference? If there had been much better coverage of Donald Trump during the campaign, would it have made a difference? You know, if there had been a lead front page story in the New York Times that said, Donald Trump's eight year, uh, um, 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 what's the word I want, saga, with a major international drug trafficker. Yeah, I think that would have had some effect if it had been on TV. He might, he, he, he might have went won, he might not have won. We're not going to know. But there's no excuse for the absolute failure to write about stuff when it's all in the public record. 12 foreign, national, 12 foreign television crews come to Rochester, New York to my house to film me. And I get one phone call from the New York Times about a, a, a document, which I didn't happen to have, but I would have given. Um, Washington Post, you know. Half a dozen phone calls, gave them maybe 100, 200 pages of documents they asked for. The coverage was just appalling. And I, we're not going to know. We're not going to know, but hopefully people are beginning to see that we've made a mistake. We're never, the people who are racists are always going to be with Donald. Okay, we're going to, basically the next uh, election, if Donald runs, we're going to tell you exactly how many people in America are really racists. Hey, David. I heard Fran Lebowitz on Bill Maher's show last week. Mm. She's just the most recent person to state the possibility that Trump would really just, he hates the job, he sucks at it, that he would find a way to quit. Can you see a way forward No, that? that Donald Trump will never resign. His ego will not allow him to. Donald believes, and Donald has believed this for decades, that he should be the president of the United States, but he believes the president of the United States is a job of a dictator. Just listen to his language. But now, the, the only way Donald would resign is a serious health problem. And then I doubt that he would resign then. Hi. Hi. Uh, because the media has been almost willing to cover every tweet that Donald Trump puts out, which is multiple times a day, and is that the reason, because he is completely distracting us, 
that we have not yeah. covered policy and things that are important to the American people? Well, Donald Trump's use of tweets is, in fact, very well calibrated and thought through to get us off of what he wants us to be off of and onto what he wants us to be onto. That's part of it. I mean, Donald is, is not a, a complete buffoon. He's ignorant. Uh, he's not a strategic thinker. Uh, he's very much driven by emotion. But he's a master con artist. He's the greatest con artist in the history of the world. And he knows how to get you off what he wants you off of. The reason, however, government isn't being covered is newspapers, you know, the, you know what the fastest disappearing white collar job in America has been since 2000? It's in the Labor Department data. We're it. You know, we're it. I'm lucky. I got lots of work. But most people aren't. So it's part of it. Mike? There's a man who's questioned I, want, I, I fear. Oh, <laughs> no, I, no. Over here first. Sorry to uh, intrude. Uh, you're a wordsmith? And you've already been dealing with... There are with, editors who would challenge that. Well, I, I've been an editor and a, report, and a writer, uh, so I know both sides. Uh, and then there was a... Frankly, we kill all the editors first. That was a, a, a motto uh, at my old newspaper. Um, but you've been dealing with Trump fatigue and, you know, the decline in newspapers. And I was, and you dealt with Nancy Pelosi with her $4,000 clothes. And uh, I'm curious, because in the Times and Sunday, they had an, a letters to the uh, editor page where they entreated people to spell their messages that they wanted the Democratic Party to use. I was curious, in your you know, expertise, what message would you format? How would you express what has to be expressed in within the elevator pitch length that you were only given in today's media, or rather today's consciousness, not, to not, get through? Or was that a different approach you would yeah. take? Well, not to be a cop out, but you know, I'm an investigative reporter, I'm not a political advisor, okay? But the message broadly has to be from the Democrats, here's what we're gonna do for you. Here's how we're gonna get your incomes up. Here's how we're gonna make the, get rid of the pothole tax. You know, every time you get a front end alignment, that's the pothole tax you're paying. There's no free lunch here. Um, we're going to get better education, et cetera, et cetera. They've got to, in a, in a way that resonates with people, connect with them, and they need, that's advertising and that's marketing. And th that's what they need to do. They've got to distill this down to messages and copy Donald Trump on one thing, you know, I love you. That's unbelievably effective. Why haven't we been able to see Donald Trump's taxes? And do you think, do you think that'll happen? And secondly, right. where do you think the Mueller investigation is going to end up? So why haven't we seen Donald Trump's taxes? Will we see them? And what's going, what's going to happen with Mueller? Uh, except for the, the one year that I got, which I think Donald sent to me, and the three pages that the New York Times and the New York Daily News got of the front pages of his 95 state tax returns and the minimal records that came out in the 70s that I wrote about in my first book, Temples of Chance, back in 1992. We haven't seen any of his tax data. Um, there's no law requiring disclosure. Uh, I have written that Congress should pass a law that says anybody who appears on a ballot in 20 states to, for president, primary or general election, uh, the IRS will disclose the last six years of their tax returns, redacting only the standard information we do, which is you know your, your personal social security number and things like that, including all the attached files. Uh, we need to have this stuff. We need to be able to look at this stuff. And no, we're never going to see Donald Trump's tax return unless Mueller introduces them into the court record. Uh, secondly, what was the second part? Oh, where's Mueller going? Um, Mueller is busy going after people you've never heard of, and there will be more. There have been many witnesses called before Mueller. They have, I'm almost positive, millions of pages of documents because they've hired a document firm to manage the documents for them. Okay, that tells you whatever it is, it's enormous. And the case they're going to make is going to involve clerks. And I mean, imagine somebody came into the newsrooms you people have worked in and wanted to make a case, you know. They don't, they're not going to be nearly as interested in talking to me or to you as they're going to be interested in talking to the news clerks and the secretaries and whoever handled the expense accounts and things like that. And Mueller is working on those people with an incredible team of people. 
the big issue Mueller is going to face is there is a Justice Department regulation that you may not indict a sitting president. This grew out of Nixon. There's no law that prevents this, and, and it isn't just me saying that. Larry Tribe says that. There's nobody is a better expert on the Constitution than Larry Tribe. I don't think because of that regulation that Mueller will move directly to indict him. But if we have the current leaders of Congress, even if they produce a tape where he pledges loyalty to Vladimir Putin and says he's going to overthrow the government of the U.S., I, honest to God, don't believe Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell will come to their senses. <laughs> they, they don't, I don't think they grasp what they're doing to their own party. So, uh, but Mueller will do a thorough, complete job on his schedule. Um, Where's the, back to, here. To what extent, given the damage you've described to government agencies, to what extent is this damage reversible? Oh, that's e a great question. Even assuming the Democrats get back the House of Representatives. Uh, some of the things Trump has done are immediately reversible by simply putting in a new administration and better policies. Uh, we can put back in place the regulation that was being promulgated about sleep apnea, for example, and you just have to go through the time process of a couple of months to get it made into uh, practice. But we can't do that with all the federal lifetime appointments to federal judgeships. And you've seen some of these people withdraw because they were ludicrously ill-prepared. I mean, they made Betsy DeVos look competent, some of these people. <laughs> and that damage will be very lasting. Where they have corrupted records, we do not literally know yet that they have either corrupted or destroyed records of, for example, polluters. We have millions and millions of records going back to the early 1970s of point source solution. This pipe in this river put out these things on these days. People within EPA believe that they have messed with those records. If they have, they have become useless for criminal purposes forever and they've been compromised for um, civil purposes. And the people who did it, unless they were dumb enough to write an email saying, I'm going to make sure the government can't enforce the law, we can't touch them. Um, so it's a mix of things. Uh, but more deeply than that, if we get a new Congress, we need to have a new Congress that stops this decades of taking from the many to give to the few. If we don't put a stop to that, then we, you know, we're just going to be another uh, oligarchy. Uh, was, if, oh, Alan. As a way to say thank you for a wonderful speech and a great body of work, you could mysteriously marshal the force of this room to work for free. What would I have what you do? Would be the, what would you have us doing? What would be the most underreported story of the Trump administration? Um, I actually don't think a story is the most important thing to do right now, okay? I literally believe the most important thing to do is for people to start working now in those districts which can be changed, either because the incumbent is not running again or the incumbent is vulnerable, to get people registered to vote and then to be organized and in advance be prepared. If you have to go, one of, one of my children is, who lives in Canada, there actually are people who left over the Iraq war and went to Canada. My seventh child is one of them. She's a child, she's a child lawyer now. She represents children. Um, go before election day to those districts where a change can happen. Get a hotel room, connect up with people, drive people to the polls. Because at the end of the day, democracy is about one thing, voting. Just about voting. Um, if it's actually a news story, I don't know. I mean, this is, as the Pentagon likes to say, a target-rich environment. <laughs> I don't think there's any question that uh, the uh, Here's my question. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you put out these books years ago talking about these outrages that Trump has perpetrated. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that nobody at the New York Times is interested in these, in these facts. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that Rachel Maddow is not in, why have these well they, there's, to, there's something missing from this yeah. story well first of all the 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 making of Donald Trump came out in August of 2016 this book came out January 16th last month okay the, but Wayne Barrett did work 
um, and I did work. We were the first two reporters to really seriously cover Trump and a reporter at the Journal whose career Donald managed to ruin. Um, it is one of the great mysteries why Donald Trump has not been treated seriously. And it isn't just the Times. It's the whole news business, okay? Um, I, I have been interviewed by a couple of professors of sociology and journalism about what's going on here. And I, my, my, my best guess, which is probably wrong, is that he's so fascinating, everybody forgets about the basics. Just the most absolute basic things. I mean, it's like if you had to write an obituary today on deadline of somebody who was famous in the 90s or the aughts, you'd have a real tough time because it would say, you know, uh, Alan Dodds Frank, who was a senior official in the State Department instead of Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Weapons Control. It, it, somebody from the 40s, 50s, 60s, you can write them like this because there's details in them. And as we've gotten into telling narrative, in addition to that, remember two things. Donald Trump makes everybody sign a non-disclosure agreement. Even volunteers in his campaign, in many cases, had to sign non-disclosure agreements that included a lifetime prohibition on ever saying anything negative about Donald Trump or his family. I don't think they're legal, but you know, if you're a school teacher in Iowa, are you gonna risk you know, your house over this? I don't think so, you're just gonna keep your mouth shut. Um, and, and as a result of those non-disclosure agreements, we aren't seeing who Donald Trump really is. I mean, the two that have come out about Stormy Daniels and uh, uh, Ms. McDougal, guarantee you 100% they're not the only ones. <laughs> Uh, okay, you say uh, he's not going to indict Donald Trump. I, I don't. I don't know because he may not. He may Let's wait for Congress. You're right. Uh, what if he indicts Kushner and uh, Donald ah? Trump? That's, that's a good happens. question. If he pardon and then follow up. What if Donald pardon. Trump indicts uh, Kushner? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. What if Mueller indicts Kushner? Pardon me. Um, I think. I think Donald Trump w w would have less of a crisis than you think. I mean, let's remember, how many people in this room have been through a divorce? Say anything you wish you hadn't said. But how many of you would have gone to the New York Post to get stories on the front page denigrating the mother of your children if you're a guy or the father if you're a woman? Nobody but Donald Trump. And if Donald Trump has to choose between himself and upsetting his favorite daughter, He's not going to have any trouble doing that whatsoever. Donald's about Donald. And by the way, you want to really see something disturbing? Just go to an internet search engine and put in Ivanka Parrot Trump. Look at the picture of Ivanka and Donald on a bed when she's a girl of about 11. Look at the picture of Donald and Ivanka sitting on parrots having sex and where his hands are. Look at the picture of them in the doorway of his Italian sports car. And I will tell you on that last picture, the first time it was shown to me, it was not in a cell phone, it was blown up, and it had been photoshopped a little bit, so I couldn't tell who it was. And somebody said, what do you see in this picture? This, they told me, it's a Rorschach test, what do you see? And I looked at the picture and I said, that's some girl, college freshman, freshman who's decided to you know, give it up and go all out in her exploratory years with a professor. And then I was handed the second picture and went, oh my God. I mean, these, you look at these pictures. These are really disturbing pictures. And remember Donald Trump saying, if she wasn't my daughter, I'd be dating her. Remember what he said when Tiffany was in diapers. Well, she's got her mother's legs, but you know, it'll be a while till we know. On national television, he said this. So this is a man who has no shame. He has no moral core. He won't have any trouble letting Jared Kushner go to prison if it protects him. I don't think it, I don't think there'll be any difference with his sons, David, not one bit. Here. Here. David, thank you. We really enjoyed all this. Listen, I have one great sorrow in my life. Hold it right up to your face. Point it How's out. that? Okay. I have one great sorrow in my life, and that is I have a sister, a beloved sister, who does everything but write love letters to Donald Trump. And my question is. Is there any way that we can penetrate this chamber echoing the voices of Limbaugh 
and Hannity. Yeah. Uh, what can it. we? How do, how do we put a voice in there? I got it. George Lakoff, who's a cognitive scientist at UC Berkeley and who's written some really terrific books. One is called it, take, it, it Takes an Elephant, about how people learn. Has a theory, and he's been kind enough to give me private lessons. Um, and his theory is that there are basically two kinds of parent figures, the nurturing mother figure and the stern authoritarian father figure. The bond with the father is much stronger than with the mother, but if you break the bond, it is totally destroyed. And you do really big change. Donald Trump needs to somehow be unmasked that he's not the father figure. He is not protecting you. He is not helping you. He is not saving your job or the prospect of a job in the future. And I don't know exactly how you break that, but I know that in my reporting years when I've seen it broken, that boy, do people turn. And they suddenly want to give you every document you've ever heard of in the world, and you can't shut them up. So, I mean, that's the, the key, is to break that bond. And Lakoff is somebody I would encourage you to spend a little time reading about this stuff. So, What's the real power that Putin has over Trump? Well, you know, if you read transcripts of mob soldiers who don't know that they're being recorded, it's amazing how much the uh, syntax follows what you hear Donald Trump say about Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. It's like, you know, somebody says, oh, did you see that skanky woman at the club the other day? No, that's the boss's new girlfriend. Oh, her? No, no, she's beautiful. She's wonderful. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't say anything about her. My God, what a lucky man he is. Think about how Donald speaks, okay? Um, Donald is so deeply involved financially with the Russian oligarchs, who are the largest, best-funded criminal gang in the history of the world who have been trying again and again to destroy the wealth of the West, to raid the pension plans in the Netherlands and England through the Icelandic banking deal, which has never been well explained in the newspapers, by the way, um, uh, because the Icelandic banks were under the control of one of the oligarchs, who have been uh, attempting in many ways to find people and get them to be their agents, wittingly or unwittingly. The best way to think about Vladimir Putin's relationship with Donald is to think about the people on Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto. You know, Perkins, Kleiner, and those other VC firms, venture capital firms. People pitch them a thousand ideas. They fund a hundred. Ninety-five of them are total busts. They lose every penny. Four of them make back the money the 95 lost. And the last one is Google, or Amazon, or if you're Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump. And while Donald Trump was not exactly who Putin wanted, what he didn't want was Hillary Clinton. Because Hillary Clinton was very clear that she would squeeze the Russian government over Crimea right up to the edge of war. She wasn't going to go to war over Crimea, but she was going to inflict horrible pain on Vladimir Putin. And efficient pain. They weren't going to do what this administration did. I don't know if you saw this in the news, but the, the people who were just uh, recently hit with sanctions by this administration, were named. They cut and pasted the names out of Forbes. We spend all this money on financial crimes and they cut and pasted the names out of Forbes. Um, Donald is so deeply dependent and has been and compromised by Russian money. Forget all the other stuff. That, that, that's what's going on here, is money. It's the, where they got the money for the golf courses it's the, when Trump Tower opened, technically in November of, November 30th, 1983, but really in beginning of 94, of 84, there were only two buildings in Manhattan with high quality apartments where you could buy through anonymous wealth. Everywhere else you had to go to co-op board. And as my best friend David Crook likes to say, if the South had discovered New York City's co-op laws, the civil rights movement would have failed. But you could go to, Trump, and you could say, hi, I want to buy this apartment uh, all for cash in the name of Snow Inc. And, uh, uh, in Antigua. And nobody said to you, uh, I'm sorry, is that a ski lodge in, in Montana or is that a cocaine business? They didn't ask and they charged super high prices in return for not asking. And lots and lots of Russians <laughs> have done deals like this, Mike, with, with, uh, with Trump. And he's very compromised from that. Well, in, in, since he's coming to office, I haven't seen anything particularly involving mafioso. 
also haven't seen any big FBI announcements that they've closed any such cases, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's part of Donald's pattern of who he is and why he's compromised today. I don't think it's his current, the current deals. What you should be worried about is that, you know, the, the fa framers of our Constitution were so worried about corruption and they were so aware of British, I'm sorry, European monarchs who were secretly on the payroll of other countries and were traitorous. They put the word emoluments, which just means economic gain, into the Constitution three times, two different clauses. The Foreign Emoluments Clause. You know, go back and read about how Benjamin Franklin got in terrible trouble over a gift of a, of a box from the King of France. A box, a jeweled box. And the Domestic Emoluments Clause, which only applies to the President and the Vice President, that they may not receive any emoluments beyond their salary and perks from the United States or any of them. And yet we see the Secret Service and the Florida State Police and the New Jersey State Police spending lots of money at Trump properties. And by the way, they're a very clever way to not disgorge. Trump said we'll disgorge profits from foreign places. If you pay by advance billing, they will disgorge the profits because they know that the payer is a foreign government. But if you put it on your American Express card, they don't know who the real payer is, so they get to keep those profits. Guess how foreign governments now do their rooms, and they buy their steaks and their drinks. Do you, uh, do you see any circumstance, David, in which Republicans or Republicans, uh, would, there would be a groundswell against him that would effectively change Yes, things? I think there are a couple of possibilities where that could happen. I mean, the first is the most obvious one, if, and this won't happen, but if Donald suddenly went crazy and started tearing off his clothes and say, you know, the interdimensional beings are coming. <laughs> Those of you who followed uh, Alex Jones know about his rant about the interdimensional beings have taken over the elite, but because of our courageous journalism at InfoWars, it's coming out. Donald's been on that show. Um, that's one. But the other likely way this would come out is if something comes out that everybody in America realizes is a clear, undisputable record that Donald Trump is a traitor. And I use that as a political term. Remember, you cannot commit treason unless we're in time of war. We haven't been in war since August of 1945. But politically, you can be a traitor. If something crystal clear comes out, yes, I can see, because there are a lot of Republicans who know who they're dealing with, but the leadership has decided to make its bed with Trump. And so they're not going to step forward. And look what happened to Jeff Flake. The Flakes are the first family of Arizona. They named a town after him, Snowflake. But they are literally the first family of Arizona, and Jeff Flake can't run again because he criticized Trump. So, last question. You've said Myron. you've known, uh, known him for about uh, 30, 35 years? I'm, it'll be 30 years come the end of May. Forgive me, because I've not read any of your books, so I don't know if this is in any of them, but have you ever liked him? <laughs> well, it's not that I like him or don't like him. That's the point of the story about Jigsaw John. You know, it's that he's important and he's interesting, and I recognized his importance when I first met him. And, and so, you know, he's like Daryl Gates, the police chief in L.A., who, you know, had officers sleeping with women and undercover officers in Moscow and Havana. You know, it wasn't that I liked or didn't like Daryl. It was that was the story to tell, you know. Jack Welch gave up all his retirement perks because of a relatively short story I wrote in the New York Times that just explained the economics of it, about $70 million. I don't like or dislike Jack Welch. I know that he thinks I'm a monster because he's screamed and yelled at a couple of journalists who said that I, you know, uh, was their mentor. And I suppose he's entitled. I mean, if I cost you $70 million, you probably wouldn't like me either. But it isn't that I like or don't like him. It's, it's business. It's business. But I do believe, based on my judgment, that he is absolutely manifestly unqualified in terms of his education, thought process. I do not try to psych psychoanalyze him. But I do, at the end of my book, point out the standards of the Army Field Manual for advancing military officers. And that's a set of judgments that anybody should be able to make. And you can look at that and decide, you know, does he qualify? Would he have been promoted if he wasn't a draft dodger from second lieutenant to first lieutenant?